Welcome again, everyone, here on this Christmas Eve, a uh, beautiful night to be out to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been out at night, if you're the kind who likes to go out into the regions far away from cities at night and sit and look up into the sky to see the stars. Tucson is relatively better from a lot of cities. You know, we have all those light rules. My HOA uh, does not like that, our, that we are not more lit up. They send us reminders to turn on our porch lights for safety. Um, and uh, you thought I'd go an entire night without getting an HOA joke in, <laughs> but it did not work. They've promised us it won't even cost that much. Uh, but Tucson's pretty good, but we still have city lights. And, uh, you know, but if you try to go somewhere far away from the city, and you step outside and look up, you kind of are reminded of how bright the stars really are. It can be easy to forget it. You know, I noticed that this summer when I was out camping and, you know, I'd get up in the middle of the night and I'd look up. I was like, oh, look at all those stars that actually are out there. I remember as a, uh, when I was in seminary, I worked at a camp in New Jersey. And I, we were in the country part of New Jersey out on the west side. And I decided to try this with the kids. I was going to show all these these urban East Coast kids, the beauty of the stars. So we went outside at night and laid down on the field and looked up and the kids were like, could all tell where they were from based on where the light pollution was. Oh, there's Camden over there. Oh, there's Philly. Oh, there, there's Trenton. I could see Trenton up there. You could see New York and, and there were so few stars left in between the city lights. They missed out it wasn't quite the experience I was hoping for, but it's really stunning. It's really overwhelming the first time you really sort of just sit and soak it in and grasp it. And I'm convinced that it does something to you when you spend a lot of time looking around and beholding the beauty of God's creation and, and absorbing all of it and seeing your place in it and sitting there in the wonder of all the stars and how big things are, I think it makes it a little harder to be all smug and think you got it all figured out. And it also makes a lot of the kind of fakeness of our world seem really fake. It's hard to sit under the stars and think about galaxies and galaxy clusters and then come back and care about Kim Kardashian and her sisters and her unhinged ex-husband. It all seems so plastic and so fake and so irrelevant in the face of so much. It also puts a lot of our human squabbles and cravings in perspective. We get worked up about things. We get worked up about power and status. We, get, we fight over toys and clothes. I grew up in the country. It was 10 acres of woods. It was very idyllic. It had two creeks that ran together, and a beaver dammed up one of them, and I'd, I could sit on the deck and watch flocks of egrets and beavers. It, it, was, it, it was like a, a, a ranch dressing commercial. It was so beautiful. And it was kind of funny because I, I grew up with that. What did I do for playing? You played with sticks. You caught frogs. You went outside. And then, I, and then, of course, I would sit and I'd go, and I know this will shock you, but I sat and I read lots of books that were nonfiction. And then I'd go to the middle school and really not care who was popular, who was with who, who was in what group, you know. Um, I, 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 really, I really didn't care. Doesn't mean I could avoid it, I just didn't care. I mean, who needs all that when you have God's beauty and truth? When you have a spiritual connection to the world and a family at church and, and, and you come and you see the things of God, and who cares, you know, what jeans someone wears? I know this will, again, shock you. I, I absolutely hated the concept of designer jeans. And uh, as an eighth grader, this was part of my protest. I was not going to buy $50 blue jeans. Now, mind you, this is 80s money, $50 blue jeans, right? 
you wanted that little triangle on your patch, you know, you had to pay big bucks. And I actually, in a weird way, looked forward to being an adult because then I could wear the same jeans year after year after year. Now, if you see me wearing Costco work pants, no, it is an act of defiance. <laughs> I have not sold out. I still do not care, and I still don't part my hair in the middle. <laughs> but that's what living in awe and wonder and connection with God does to you. It ruins vanity and materialism. It's why it doesn't surprise me that all the people around Jerusalem who were so cosmopolitan and so in on things, so educated even, who knew the scriptures and had large portions of them memorized, who had studied the word of God so much and so carefully with a good intention and a good heart, why they would be so oblivious when the Messiah came. Because they were caught up in their politics and their positions. They were worried about keeping their jobs safe, debating which medical procedure could be done on the Sabbath and which one could wait until after the Sabbath, you know, debating elective surgery versus non-elective surgeries. It's not that that's unimportant, but it can kill your sense of awe and wonder. And politics can kill your sense of just about anything when you dig into it. To get behind the veil of any institution, right, can take the awe away from it. But the shepherds, I think about those shepherds. They're out there in the hills. They're out there 24-7. And they got nothing but them and sheep and the sky overhead. They were awake. They were in tune. They were in sync with God's world. They always listened. They had to listen. What's that sound? Is it a wolf? Is it a thief? Is it a scorpion? Are one of my sheep wounded? They, had to, they were completely in sync with God. And so they heard God's voice telling them that he'd arrived in person. That a child born of a young, was born of a young woman, as the prophet Isaiah foretold. They didn't miss it debating who got invited to whose party and who had better vacation pictures. They didn't miss it raging about who was supposedly going to take what cherished possession away from me and something like that. They didn't miss it because they'd already decided that they knew the answer and that they weren't going to talk about being God being different and they knew where God was going to come and if God didn't come in that spot it couldn't be God. They didn't miss it because they were open and they were attuned to God speaking in the world. And they were open to God saying something they hadn't already predicted. If I had to describe where the first step is in coming to hear God's voice towards experiencing God and living a life in tune with the Holy Spirit, I would say start with being open. Just start with being open. You don't know all the answers. You don't have it figured out. It isn't just said and done. It isn't case closed. God is still speaking, sending angels to us in the dark of night. God is still speaking. The words are wonderful and beautiful and unexpected and unpredictable. And there's a scariness. I'll admit, there's a scariness to keeping a faith that keeps things open that's full of this awe and wonder stuff because you really don't know how it's going to end. I think about it a little bit like when you go out to Ironwood Monument there. I go out there a lot, like I was there last week, out on my mountain bike. And you got all these old roads, and Google doesn't even have half of them on there. And you want to turn, you go, I don't know what's down here. Is this going to be good? Is it bad? Is it rough? Will my car go down it? No, I figured that out right away. 
Now you can decide, I end up having this debate with myself as I'm driving out there. Do I take the path I've already done because I know, and then I know when I come home, I'll be satisfied and happy with it, or do I turn down a road I've never turned down yet and run the risk that it's going to be all small pebbles? Have you ever tried to mountain bike on loose pebbles? It's the worst. It's almost as bad as sand. But you don't know. But what would you miss if you don't try? It could be super cool. It could be okay. It could be a ton of work. But being open means being that you could be amazed. When I've already done the road and I've tested it and I feel secure and then I'm picking it, I might be bored with the repetition. When it's new, I'm challenged and I'm thrilled. When I stay home and I scroll, I get neither. And that sense of wonder and awe and amazement, it's really kind of the sixth sense that opens doors to the voice of God. God who isn't out there so far away that we can't connect. God who isn't spying on you as some moralistic hallway monitor, checking whether you've been naughty or nice. Wait, that's somebody else. God who isn't taking a sword against the people I can't stand or who scare me. That sense is what allow you to see that God has come and is here and is one of us. A humble baby, soon to change the world. At Christmas, more than any time in the church year, we come without an agenda. There isn't a law to decode or apply there isn't really a prophecy to be heard, at least one that hasn't already been fulfilled. I don't have a great moral takeaway at the end of the night. Therefore, now that you've heard the Christmas story, these are the three steps to achieving personal self-actualization. There's just awe and wonder and the baby Jesus. There's just sitting there and looking in amazement at God being one of us. Not leaving us to our distractions and debates, but entering into our world to save us from them. It's a time to sit back and soak in the beauty of the moment of the all-powerful God sleeping in a barn. Amen.